Hi, I'm Ed Amoroso from Tag Cyber, and I'm here today with my friend Mark Clancy, who is the CEO of a cybersecurity company called Authority. Mark, I want to welcome you to our discussion. Thanks for having me, Ed. And Mark, before we get into your background, because a lot of people watching this know, know your name and have seen you in a, a number of really, really key roles, tell us about Authority. What, what, what does the company do? And then we can get into some of the tech. So Authority tackles the customer experience of authorizing transactions, right? I want to go do something. It's a huge security problem. We've built tons of stuff to get in front of it. And we've tried to simplify it by using solid security underneath, but in a way that's easy for the customer to actually get done what they want to do. And authorization is different than authentication. Correct. Authentication is, can you, can you assert you are Ed? Authorization is, hey, Ed wants to do this. <laughs> and that context of what you want to do, you want to get a new phone, you want to move money in your bank account, you want to prove to somebody you've been vaccinated, right? The context of what you're doing often gets lost with authentication, which just says, hey, who, Paul, who goes there, right? What's your password? What's your token? It doesn't ask, what do you want to do? Yeah. But the two are very related. So I guess as they're we very, get... they're intertwined. There's really a triangle, right? You have sort of identity. So like scan the password to prove that I'm Ed. Password to say, yes, this is Ed, and then authorization of, and Ed wants to get a new phone, right? It's the triangle, those three things. And we focus so much on the identity proofing and the authentication, we kind of just imply that authorization happens magically on its own, and it doesn't. That's a really good preamble. Now, look, I'm going to back you up. So, Mark, tell you, you've been a, um, a CISO. I've known you for years and um, have a ton of experience kind of in um, operational there setting. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little, what, what brought you to the, uh, to the dark side here in the, in the, yeah. uh, so, uh, so long journey, right? You know, so I, I spent a decade in change at Citigroup, uh, among other fun jobs there. Um, really two things. One, I had a, an opportunity to work with early stage companies and startups when Citi was doing strategic investments. And I did that because I was dealing with the day-to-day -day threats that we felt at a global financial institution. You know, we started responding to this threat, which we now call phishing, but we didn't have a name for it, right? And I ran the global incident response team and just all the bad things that went bump in the night we dealt with for years. Um, and, you know, really looked at the problem space. I pivoted from Citi. I went to the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, or DTCC, which for many don't know is sort of the back office of Wall Street. So every time a stock is bought and sold, DTCC moves the shares to the buyer and the money to the seller, does that across the US market, and is three of the eight systemically important financial market utilities, basically the backbone plumbing that makes finance work. Um, and so I spent a time there, and, and one of the things I did at DTCC, we're big fans of sharing threat data, and my team had built this great platform we used internally to share data using the standard called STICS, the Structured Threat Information Expression, and we actually turned that internal solution, we spun it out, productized it, and got hundreds of financial institutions and ultimately thousands of companies using it so we could rapidly exchange, here's the bad stuff that was happening in our environment so you could go defend yourself. Um, and that was sort of my accidental entrepreneurial journey. Um, after that company uh, we sold and spun off, I did a bunch of R&D stuff for a while, and then I took a position at Sprint, mobile carrier, which is now part of T-Mobile, I'm running the cybersecurity and fraud program there. And that was really what sort of set me up to why I thought authority was doing something really interesting because we had lots of hard problems where you know our answer was send the customer to the store. Right? Can't prove you are online, aren't sure if they want to do this transaction. And of course, nobody likes to be told go drive to your you know, get in your car, drive to the store and go do something, right? It's a bad experience. And then of course COVID hit and like, well, you can't go to the store now, <laughs> right? Um, and so we started thinking much more deeply about how does this process work? How do we authorize specific high-risk transactions? And how do we authorize them in the place where the customer want to interact, wants to interact, right? I remember having a conversation with my customer support team about, you know, customers who want to do certain things in Apple business chat. And we say, well, we don't have an authentication method or a identity proofing method that works there. Um, and so we had to say no. Like you got to go to the store, get on the phone and call somebody to do that transaction. And so when I saw authority solution, it really struck to me that here's a way that we could actually enable those scenarios, take those engagement platforms and turn them into transaction platforms. And so that was what attracted me. You know, I talked to the company um, and ultimately was asked to come and run it. And that's what I'm doing now. So 
So here's 25 years and three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and it's this, all because of the thing we didn't know was fishing. How's that? This is your life. <laughs> now, a lot of people, when they think authorization, they think workflow. Like I, somebody needs to do something and then an email goes to this guy and it goes to this gal and they're all clicking and all, and then the approvals come in and you're sort of authorized. Like that's one in the spectrum. And then other people think sort of like the A and IAM, like access management in some sense has some, help, help me with um, like somebody really doesn't understand this. What the, is it workflow? Is it a process? Is it technology? When you think authorization, and a lot of times we would say Auth Z because that's like yeah. shorting. But give me a little 101. On yeah, how, it's, it's at its simplest. It's the confirmation of an intent that you're allowed to do, right? So there's two parts to it. I want to do something and I'm allowed to do that thing, right? And there's two sides of it. So one of them is if I'm a customer and I want to move money, right? to I want to, you know, pay 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 the lunch bill, right? You know, I want to send you money. Uh, I have the money in my account. I want to do this. The bank has to confirm that I have the amount of funds and that I wanted to send it to you, right? So there's a whole bunch of these authorizations. Now they may get built into workflow, right? And lots of them have, um, or it may be a simple assertion that I want to send a hundred bucks to Ed, pay for this lunch, and I want it to come from this account, and I want it sent to that account that's Ed's, right? You could actually build all of those instructions together. And if we were doing it in the old fashioned world, I would write it down and I'd sign my signature and I'd put it in the mail and it would get executed, right? Well, we're trying to do that digitally now. It's the same thing, but the hard part in is how do I know that it's Mark who signed that transaction and that the details of the transaction were actually what Mark wanted to do and not somebody pretending to be Mark. So one of the things that I know you guys do that's related to this question of who's allowed to do what, is that I think you are empowering kind of end users to be involved in that decision. Tell, tell me a little bit about that question, because determining as a parent, I know what my kids are allowed to do, because I decide, they don't, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but the, what is, how does that work? How does that play in the authority? Uh, yeah, so, so let's go through a typical bank, like, you know, I'm, I run a small business here, I got bills I gotta pay. So if I want to pay somebody new and I go to my bank and I'm at a mega bank, right? And they're all very similar, unfortunately, in this regard. So step one, I go in online, I sign in with a username and password. In order to get my account in the first place, I had to prove I was me. So I actually had to go to the branch, show them my driver's license, fill out a form, get the other signatories in the account to approve it, like all kinds of stuff. That was the identity proofing step. I had to do that in the branch. Then I got my username and password, I go online, and of course, then they text me a code or whatever kind of thing that proves that it's me because I have my phone, which is a whole other thing we can talk about. Um, and then I go in and I add a payee, and guess what? Another authentication event, another two, you know, another SMS code, I add the payee. Then lo and behold, I actually fill in the instructions and pay the person, I gotta prove that again, right? And they're doing these workflow, it's basically turned into workflow, which is here's all the steps, but at each step of the workflow, I have to re-authenticate, right? That's kind of the model that most of us have become used to, unfortunately, online banking. And in an authorization-centric approach, I would do the identity proofing once. In the case of authority, we'd put a private key on your phone in an app, like including the Megabank app. And now I want to do this wire payment. I would say, I want to pay this amount of money to this destination, to this account. And maybe there's other details like, you know, for consulting services, whatever it might be. And I digitally sign that transaction and I push that signed transaction to the bank. They look at it, they validate the details, match the signature, and they act on it. And so the model is that I put the customer in control of telling the bank what to do, not guiding the bank customer through a series of hoops they have to jump through, like you're a jog on an agility course, right? To get to the outcome the customer wanted in the first place. And that's a big shift. It's kind of inverting the model to putting the customer in control of the instruction, not the bank playing 20 questions. So my experience with public key infrastructure is that the underlying coordination management and you know, basically the infrastructure, the I in PKI has been the hard part. Yep. So you said very quickly, you said we put a public key on the, on, on, you know, on, on essentially on your phone. Um, there's a lot of wallop packed in that sentence. How, how are you managing these keys and what, what's the, because I would imagine that's the piece that authority probably is, um, is yeah. deep 
Hobden, what, what do you guys do? How do you, how do you coordinate all of that? So, so, so a couple of pieces. So first thing you have to realize is that modern smartphones have hardware protected key storage. So they can store these encryption keys, signing keys, et cetera, in a tamper proof, resilient container on the phone itself. Is that the TPM referring to TPM? Uh, yeah, it's it's not necessarily a TPM, but it's a trusted execution environment is what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Um, TPM is a slightly different technology, but similar space. But it's trusted basically execution. a root of trust hardware T way to protect. Yeah, got it. And so that it can't be extracted and pried out and those kind of things, right? So with that, the way that we get a key in there is we take our software development kit and put it inside an app. So I'm, you know, the My Bank app or, what, or the My Telco app, right? And when you sign up to that app and you do an identity proofing step, we push a key to the device and store it in that secure storage. And then it's sitting there. And so every time you want to do something, you do it using that key that's already distributed to your phone, right? And yes, if you lose a phone, there's a process to you know, get a new key or back up your existing key. There's ways to handle that too. Um, but because we've done that, we did the identity binding and establishing the key once, you can continue to do transactions over and over without jumping through the same hoops. You know, the most you're doing is unlocking your phone with your fingerprint or your face, perhaps, right? And not, you know, waiting for a text and all this other stuff that the authentication approaches have taken us to. You know, authentication still matters, right? It's part of the story. But we've shifted it instead of authenticating every single step on the journey, signing into the website, adding the payee, setting the amount, right? We're doing that once up front, and then we're just saying, this is what I want to do. And we're pro essentially providing an assertion back to the company that it was Mark and this Mark approved this particular transaction, you know, whatever it was, right? Whether it's moving money, getting a new phone. Heck, you know, one of the hard problems in Telco, and I'm sure you had this at at and is, you know, you have all these family plans, right? H how do I let my kid who's on the other side of the country go to the store and get a new phone? Yeah. Right. I'm the account holder, right? Well, today the answer is, you know, go to the store, right? It's it's not a great experience. But what if I could just give the permission slip, if it were, to the other person on my account? And they could show up and they could be validated and they could act, right? That's the kind of approach that we've built. You can solve those types of problems, which are really tricky to solve today with the way that we've built this sort of workflow journey on all these incremental authenticate, authenticate, authenticate steps. Mark, in the, the marketing question now, are you guys kind of uh, getting consumers excited about this or do you tend to sell to the businesses uh, as a way to maybe reduce yeah, friction? Yeah, we're, we're selling to the business to business team and we're really having success with people who are looking at that customer experience because they're hearing the feedback from their customers. You know, we're not a platform that you as an individual consumer go buy our solution and you can do something with it. It really has to be embedded into those businesses you operate with. Um, ironically, the security teams think this problem solved. You know, we've, we've created a, such a high bar with all these authentication tools and gizmos and, you know, predictive analytics and all this kind of stuff um, that they think, you know, we're done, right? There's nothing, nothing to see here. And when you talk to end customers, they think the whole process is beyond frustrating, right? And so we are taking a customer frustration and solving it with a security solution um, and because we stepped back and we looked at what's the whole thing we're trying to do here, right? And I think what happened, and I've been as guilty as this as an ex, you have a lot of incrementalism, right? There's tons of regulations that you had to go from passwords to strong authentication, strong authentication, strong authentication. Okay, we did that, right? But it only took us so far. And then, then it's like analytics, analytics, analytics. And we added, I mean, I had a team of data scientists before, and we absolutely tried to figure out what you're trying to do. But we never came up with a way to ask the actual customer what they wanted to do in the first place and not somebody pretending to be the customer. That was the problem, right? And so when you step back and look at it that way, then we actually came up with a very different approach to that puzzle. You know, um, we've mentioned two use cases here, one around finance, the other around sort of sign up for something like um, uh, telephony, um, you know, mobile plans. What are so? Are there any sort of wild uh, cases yeah, or so use cases? I'll give you one. We're talking to an early stage company that's in the uh, HR benefit space, <laughs> and one of the benefits they give employers is a way to hire personal help. Like you need a nanny or a babysitter, right? And so they'll give to that to you to their employees as a benefit, where you get you know 50 hours of babysitting a year or something like that. I mean, whatever the number is. 
So now we're in the pandemic. How do you know the babysitter has been vaccinated, right? So how do you sort of build that chain of events? And there's a lot of complexity and there's health data and all this kind of complexity, but how do you assert to a parent when the babysitter shows up at the door that this you know, babysitter has actually been vaccinated or tested or whatever the particular requirement was? And so we're looking at how do we use this authorization technology to collect the consent and the assertion of the babysitter that they're okay with transmitting this data, of course, that we validated that their vaccine certificate or testing or whatever is in order, and that we can then push that to the parent in a way that they can confirm that it's true when the person shows up, right? And that's one of the ways we're using the permission codes is to kind of solve those really hard real world problems that sort of cross over the digital and physical world. That's interesting. I love that case. Now, looking forward into the future here, well, let's use an analogy first, and then I want to hear your sort of view into your crystal ball. But the authentication community appears to be moving more and more toward passwordless experiences. Like That's there's right. a very, very clear, um, you know, objective that we'd like to remove that friction. What do you see over in the Auth C world? Like in the coming years, is there a similar aspirational goal that you see? Is it really just re reducing friction? Is it automating? Is it um, somehow making this invisible? Is it saving people time? What, what are some of the aspirations that we should look forward to in the coming years in this area? Yeah, I think you know the password list is a great direction. I mean, I really say that passwords and SMS authentication have to die, right? There's just too many ways <laughs> it can go wrong. Right. And but yet it's also at least common denominator, which is why it's persisted so long. Right. Um, so looking forward, I, you know, I, I definitely see the direction to uh, passwordless. I also see a direction towards its identity proofing with document scanning and, you know, that kind of stuff. And those two things connecting. And then the third wheel, you know, third leg of the stool is right. This authorization. And I see authorization moving from something that was implicit in the past. Well, because you authenticated and we identity proved, it must be what you wanted to have happen, right? That's kind of how we are today. To an explicit statement, I want to do this. And that the customer is in control in that decision, not as much the business, right? The business is enabling the ability to act on that customer intention. And the big challenge we've had is, you know, how do I know it was the customer and that's what they wanted to do, right? And by reverse engineering that, which is kind of the state of the art today, you're just still guessing. And maybe your guesses are getting better, maybe you have really good analytics and your guesses are 99% right. They're still 1% wrong, right? <laughs> and so how do you get to being close to 100% right that it is the customer who wants to do something? And that's where authorization goes. In the end, to the end customer, it should become invisible. It should be just stuff we handle as technologists, right? It should get taken care of. And yes, they know that's what they're doing. They're thinking, I need to do this thing. I want this thing to happen. And the way that we put it together with the other three parts of the puzzle, it just happens, right? That's the ultimate state. But on the technology side, it's a positive assertion that the customer wanted to have happen, not an implicit, well, yeah. these other things happen, so it must be what they want. So I'm counting two things here. Tell me if this is the right summary. One would be that the process becomes more invisible, less friction. And second, I'm empowering the user to make an explicit decision. Right. That's kind of where this is and, headed. And make it from the place where they are. So if yeah. they, they don't have to go to the website. They don't have to go to the store. They don't have to call the call center, right? They, they're they in chat. They're in Twitter and they want to do this kind of thing. They can do it. Right. And that's a huge leap from where we are today, where everything has to be in a specific channel with a whole bunch of constraints around it. Like, hey, oh, by the way, I need to send Ed money for lunch. Right. Boom. It just happens. Right. Alexa, you know, send, send Ed 100 bucks to repay him for lunch. And then just, it just goes. Right. That's awesome. There's a machine Mark, keeping in the background somewhere right now. <laughs> Are you, um, it seems like, but it's, you're enjoying running the company? Is this um, this good gig yeah, for you? I like, I like the energy and the, the clean, quite the clean slate approach that you can have in a startup. It's much harder to do in a big company. There's just a lot of other pressures and constraints. And so you can really have some of this sort of groundbreaking step back. I'm like, well, what if we did something completely different, right? At the same time, you know, running startups is you're always five seconds away from death too, right? <laughs> it's kind of that life on the edge problem. Um, <laughs> but it's a good focusing tool and, and you can really kind of dive into an issue at depth. Whereas as a CISO, I got 800 fires a day, right? Yeah. And I'm just trying to keep them from really burning out of control most of the time. 
Uh, so it's a different set of pressures. It's awesome. Hey, if people are interested in more, what's the um, what's the website? Is it authority.net or authority.net? That... And that's authority with uh, I at the end. Yes, a u t h o r i t i dot n e t. Awesome. Well, listen, Mark, I want to thank you for making some time today. I'm, on behalf of my team at Tag Cyber, thank you so much. We love working with you guys. It's good, good uh, discussion. Yeah, thanks. Great speaking with you guys. Yeah, and for the people who are watching, um, I want to thank you all for spending a little time with us. I uh, hope you enjoyed learning from Mark, and we will see you all next time.